Hello and welcome to Creative Vitality Jam Sessions. Here we have intimate conversations with extraordinary dance and theater artists about reimagining creativity and supporting and building community. CV, JS, and I walk in solidarity and as allies for equality, justice, and respect. Black Lives Matter. Let's unite. I'm Helen Pickett, and today's guest is Damon Hart, exclusive personal trainer and leveled Pilates instructor. Damon and I have known each other since 1991. Welcome, Damon. Hello, hello. Hi, Damon. How are you? Um, I'm well, and it's so wonderful to see your beautiful, bright face. Mm -hmm. It's been a long time. A very long time. Yeah, yeah. So I just want to tell our audience that you are the 12th session of At Home with Foresight okay. Family. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get it to 100 one of these days. Yeah, really? Well, I don't even know if we have that many in our family, but... <laughs> <laughs> so happy, so, so happy to be sitting here with you. Same. So my first question for everybody in these sessions is where in the world are you? So I'm in Amsterdam, in Holland, in the Netherlands, and um, I've been here since 2008. Wow, it's one of my favorite cities. It is. And you are a person that I must also think about while, being, uh, while living here because we were performing once here in Amsterdam and I was making a joke about one day I would like to have like the partner with the picket fence and the dog and stuff living here in Amsterdam. And you said something to me, I can't remember the words at that time, but I just remember this connection of you saying like, I don't like that could be a dream that would come true one day. And when this actually happened, I actually moved here. It was really like, I, I thought about you because it's funny sometimes you plant little seeds in the universe and they actually do develop and you end up living, yeah, in a place that you only spoke about in the past, you know? It's so funny you bring that up. I brought that, I was talking about that with another person a few days ago, how, you know, we're at the point in our lives, you're younger than me by a few years, but we're at the point of our lives where I told this to a younger person that at your age, I could have never known yes. how extraordinary my life would be at yes. this age. Yeah. Right? It's true. It's true. It's so true. You know, uh, if you could have told me, like when I was a 10 year old boy living in Los Angeles, that my life would have taken this path, I would, I probably would have been very excited, but also wondering like, how's it gonna happen, you know? I mean, it is amazing, it's extraordinary. It's, yeah, pretty amazing. The other thing that's kind of quelled my fears over the years is that, it's like you said about planting seeds, right? Yes. You know, but something that I really got comfortable with over the years is that, you know, the timeline isn't always what you think it's going to be. Yes. But what true. I have found is that most of these dreams that I did dream of yeah. eventually happened. It yeah. wasn't exactly like in the next year, I'm going to be yeah, yeah, yeah. in the United States. You know, well, I haven't become the president yet. <laughs> Keep the dream alive. <laughs> it's actually not my thing. <laughs> Man, you know. <laughs> but, you know, it, it also made me realize, like, some of the stuff that still hasn't happened or I haven't yet manifested, I think, you know what? Yes. Don't give up. Yes, it's true. Yeah. It's so yeah. true. Yeah. yeah. So, Damon, my love, let's start with some recent history. Okay. Um, in 2009, you became a level Pilates trainer yeah. and a teacher of teachers. Yeah. Please explain what leveled means in this context. So, a level trainer is um, their levels. When we start um, in our organization, when we're certified, you start as a level five trainer. And you go up through the levels up to one, which there are very few of those in the world, uh, only maybe a handful. And um, yeah, I was promoted last year to level four, which means that I can actually begin people in the education on the basic level. Um, when you go up to level three and such, you can do people on the intermediate and also the advanced levels. So 
And is that through practice that you get to, you have to take, is there a test or an exam that you take? So there was a, there's a sort of an exam. They know you very well through the, uh, the years of being in the organization. Um, but uh, in 2019, we went to Paris, uh, myself and two other colleagues of mine who were leveled um, to be seen, to teach, and also to, um, yeah, show our skills to uh, one of the higher level trainers, uh, the Shari Mejia, who is one of the runners of the organization. And um, afterwards, uh, you wait a while and they kind of give their uh, comments and their remarks. And then, yeah, we received our uh, information about a month later that we were certified, that we were leveled, sorry. And is it, is it something to aspire to, to keep going up? Is sure. Is you want to do? Sure. I mean, you know, I have a wonderful teacher, Margie Oren, who is a level X um, trainer. She is one of three level X that exist in the world because instead of making them level ones, they created for them especially a level X. She and two other colleagues of ours in the organization. She is absolutely amazing. And, um, you know, really someone to aspire to. So because she's been in this business over like 27 years and also because she's so giftedly talented, um, she is really someone to, to watch and, and you kind of see where you would like to go in your own in your own teaching skills because she is really a teacher of teachers. Yeah. Wow. And are you still, have you still pursued the personal trainer aspect? No, that sort of stopped the minute actually that I began my education with Pilates because I couldn't do them both at the same time. And it was through uh, Myra, Myra Rodriguez and Matthews in Frankfurt who uh, spoke of the idea to do my education for Pilates. And um, it was she who introduced me to Marjorie. I came to Holland and that's how my education basically began. Wow, yeah. amazing. What a great yeah. path. And of course, this is after you retired, but we'll get to that. Um, so um, prior to COVID, did this training take you all over the world? Or do you, do you still have your own home studio? Was it called Shen Pilates? So Shen was a studio. So that's not the studio I work in today. Shen was a studio that I, um, when I came to Amsterdam, I came to open studio with a friend of mine that I had at the time. Um, and it was a beautiful studio uh, in the south of the city where um, yeah, um, I've been in that area since the last, yeah, the last 12 years or so, yeah. So, um, and unfortunately that studio closed a year after it opened. Oh. But, uh, I had a lot of clients who I was training and they all kind of followed me where I went to. I went from there to the Hilton Hotel, which is close by that studio. And uh, a few years after that, I was offered to go to the studio where I'm working now in, this, uh, in the South as well. So beautiful. Yeah. So, um, so you retired in 2004 and yes. that's when you went to the personal training, but then in 2005, you started this road, correct? With the Romani yes. Pilates education in Den Haag. Yes. So what was it um, that, that drew you? Because a little side note, one of my oldest friends from ballet school, who is also from LA, um, has a Pilates studio in Pasadena called Zoe. It's her first name. Okay. And like you, Pilates just took her. She was, yeah. she, it just inspired her so much that she made it her life. So yeah. was that similar for you and why? So the initial uh, start of it was not that much of a click. Um, I was, uh, so I actually began to teach, take class with Myra in Frankfurt to prepare for my, for my um, meeting with Marjorie. Um, and uh, that was also wonderful. Um, but when I began my education with Marjorie and she began to speak about the human body and this method, that's when the click happened for me. I was like, this is amazing. This was literally like someone teaching you things that you actually understood or knew to be true, but no, no one ever expressed in words like, um, you know, the, the, uh, the fact that how babies actually began to develop their spines. The first thing they do is they lift their heads up, you know? And then they start to crawl, which forms another part of the spine. And after crawling and all these things for a while, the spine begins to take its shape. And that's when they begin to start to try to stand up and eventually walk. And these things, I mean, they're so 
profound that you you know they're true, but you know one ever expressed to you how this stuff actually happens. And so also, you know, as a dancer, uh, being so fascinated with flexibility as I was, understanding how the hips work, how things actually work in the body to, uh, to be able to achieve certain things, you know? Um, and we as dancers are very aware of our bodies. Um, we feel them, but we don't always understand everything from a technical level or from a physiological level, how things work inside the body, unless you actually study and um, learn about the body. But uh, it was really, it was so fascinating. I was like, I have landed on the right place at the right time. <laughs> yeah, it was That's amazing. amazing. So, because, I mean, we'll get to it actually right now in the next question, but it's, it's interesting. It's like the ballet and yes. Pilates kind of yes. took you in similar ways in different points in your life. Yes. And, yes. and opportunities were presented to you that just were like, yeah. And, but, but your path in dance was a little bit more, uh, and I'll, I'll speak about it now, but it was a little bit more familial. I love it that it was born from your auntie and your mom. So, yes. so some earlier history now, you describe your mom yes. as being a great dancer. In fact, yes. your mom won contests in high school and was asked to be on the Flip Wilson show, which I remember, <laughs> <laughs> and I watched and um, and you say that you know your auntie and your mom were dancing all the time at home yes. you got the dancing bug early uh, at yes. five years old um, yes. and so the question is and I think I know this but um, your mom's love for dance probably you talk about seed being planted um, yes. probably very strong right Yes. You know, her love for dancing. I mean, dancing, there was a time when actually my aunt and my mother, um, my brother and I lived with them for a short period of time. I think my mother had the apartment and my aunt had moved in with us for a period. So music was always around. We we're always just dancing and listening to music. And that was for me always a fun moment. We even did like lip syncing and like um, uh, shows and stuff, which I didn't even know. I mean, I didn't know lip syncing was at that time, but they would put like a little wig on us and stuff. We would do like shows and stuff. And so this was just fun for us. And even as I got you know older in those later years, like from five to seven, eight, nine, and 10, you know, it was popular if you could dance in school, like people, um, yeah, you were kind of in if you could do the latest dances. And so for me, dance was always, yeah, always around. I never really thought about it as a career. Um, I enjoyed it so much. And I think somehow when I got into my junior high school, that's when the challenges and the fascination became to grow further right. um, until I yeah, finally saw this documentary about Mikhail Brishnikov when I was 14. And a friend of mine from my junior high school said, oh, there's a studio close by our uh, school here if you'd like to go there. And that's how this ball began to roll because when I saw that, for me, that was like the pinnacle peak of uh, achieving the greatness in dancing, you know, that you could do ballet. I mean, uh, and when I started in this, the studio where I went to, um, they were like, oh, he's talented and stuff. And uh, I could also feel my body quickly, like, yeah, growing and developing. And the fascination, you know, with dancers, young dancers, it's amazing when you see that your effort put into your work uh, produces you know, you becoming better, you getting stronger, you getting yeah, more accomplished in what you're doing. And that really is a driving force to make a person really go uh, on with dancing, I believe. Yeah. Well, it's a driving, it was a driving force for you as it was for, for me. Like, um, sure. because obviously I always say that the motor part of our brain must be, you know, in dancers, um, I think it gets elevated through our dance training, but I think sure. I wonder sometimes if it is already ignited. I mean, your motor part of your brain, your dance part of your brain was already, you know, to use the word again, ignited from your, from home. But then, yes. and then, and then obviously you could move, right? Because you got yes. the, the dances of the day and that was yes. making possible, you know, yes. like popular. But yeah. I think that, um, oh, sorry, I got distracted. You know me. Okay. Um, okay. So um, I think that 
this kind of fate, I wrote this down, you know, that fate stepped in to change your course. Yes. Um, and you had this dance yes. at school, right? This performance. Yes. Yes. So in my junior high school, we had actually little performance. We would do like um, uh, contemporary songs like Footloose and Thriller and these kind of songs, which um, we would do like little shows at the end of the year. Or it, I think also like we had like maybe two shows here, mid mid year and the end of the year. And um, those were really fun. And they were also, you know, I was developing also my abilities to dance, um, but it was not on the level of like ballet. Yeah, it wasn't like we weren't doing, it wasn't so, yeah, it wasn't that level yet. And somehow when I saw that documentary by Vershnikov and this thing clicked to do ballet, I was like, I, you know, and even at the time, you know, there was nobody doing ballet in my family. So the idea to present, to present this to my family to say like, I would like to do ballet. I thought they would just say, oh, what are you talking about? You're foolish, you know, just forget about this. But unknowingly to my, <laughs> my father actually said, well, okay, sure. I'll take you to the ballet classes on the weekend. I was like, it was really shocking. And um, yeah, that was a special time for my father and I to like just drive back and forth to ballet school in the, uh, on the Saturday morning to go and do that. And um, yeah, it was, yeah, it was just but such a- also a performance before that where you spoke about a performance- Yeah. Um, where your mom got to see you on stage for the first time. Yes, that was Did in my junior high school. ballet school? In the junior high school, yes, in the junior high school. Yeah. Okay, okay. okay. And, and what was that like? What was? Um, I think the first time they saw me, they, there were photos. I did a duet actually with a, a school colleague. We did a duet to Patti LaBelle's You Are My Friend. And um, it was very cute. It was, uh, yeah. And there was, I just remember also these applauses, like the people started to, I do like a hitch kick at one time to come out of the stage. And I heard like people like, ah. <laughs> I, just, I was like, what's going on? And that was a, uh, I mean, I was never really like a dancer who was like after applause and stuff, but I really just, it was fascinating to hear what was happening, like the reaction that people were having. And after that performance, my mother was there. She was very proud, of course. And um, people were coming out of the, the theater and they were like, um, these girls came into her. She was like, can, can I touch them? Can I kiss them? And she was like, okay. <laughs> it was so funny. It was, yeah, it was very cute, very cute at that time. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. I'm glad your mom got to be a part of that too. <laughs> yes. Right? Yes. So so you spoke about this a bit. At age 14, yes. uh, your dance life started accelerating. Like you said, yes. you saw this documentary in Barishnikov. Yes. Um, and then your you spoke to you were speaking to your friend the next day, spoke yes. about this place where you would go to classes. Yeah. Um, you got a full scholarship actually at the school um, and then joined the Los Angeles High School of Performing Arts. Yes. Um, and this is where you spoke about your dad taking you back and forth. And that's also such a great bonding between yes. dad and you about this. Yes. And then you spoke about your teacher, Donald Hewitt. Yes. Definitely. Also a connection with Zoe. Oh my LA. God, see? She also worked with <laughs> Um, and then the next chapter of your journey is remarkable. Um, can you share your story of Arthur Mitchell and Cicely Tyson? Yes, yes. So um, back to, let's go quickly back to Mr. Hugh. Uh, Donald Hugh was the ballet teacher of the, of the school of the Los Angeles High School for Performing Arts. Okay. Um, and he literally took a chance on me because I had just started ballet in that studio prior to the school opening. So I had a little bit of knowledge of ballet, but not enough. There are kids in school who really were, had been studying for years and like for them to be in the school, they were looking at like on a real professional level to just to really become a dancer in a company. Um, and he kind of said, well, I'm gonna take a chance on you because you're very talented, you're very flexible, you have good pirouettes, you have good things to work with but you're not level, yet on the level of the, the other kids in, in the class, but I'm gonna push you to be with them and it will really, will really help you to get um, get on track basically. So um, in that first year of the school, Arthur Mitchell was asked to become, uh, to come by and to give us a, a guest, uh, a, a, as guest teacher to, to give us class at the school. Um, and he saw me and he was also kind of uh, interested in me immediately. He saw that nice feet and stuff and he was, he saw I was flexible. 
So he said, a young man, I, I would like you to come and be a super for us in Firebird, which they were performing in Pasadena at the time. And so um, I started doing that. And one of the performances uh, that I'd gone to after the show, um, he was there in the hall and Miss Tyson was there with him. And he said, oh, I'd like to introduce this young man to you, Miss Tyson. And uh, he said, this is Damon Hart. Uh, we'd like to invite him to the school this summer. Um, and he said, young man, show your feet, show your feet. <laughs> so I took my shoulder, pointed my foot. She said, oh yeah, beautiful feet, all this stuff. And uh, she was so sweet. And um, he said, are your parents here tonight? I said, no, I'm gonna call them now to have them come and pick me up. And he said, um, and then she said, she, she, she and she was like, um, I'll take him home. I was like, he said, young man, call your parents to tell them the Mr. Sister Tyson will be taking you home tonight. I was like, oh my God. So I go call my parents. They're like freaking out there. Oh my God, oh my God. So I think we're just going directly home, but they're like, oh, aren't you hungry? We should go have something to eat. So I think I had to call them again to let them know that we we're going to have some, some dinner before getting home so they wouldn't be worried why we're taking so long. So we went to a restaurant, had dinner and stuff, and they uh, her driver took me home. But it was such a special uh, meeting with her. And also she was the one who um, paid for my summer course when I went that, uh, that summer to the, to the National Parliament Center wow. School. Yeah, yeah. What a, what a beautiful story. Yes. What a, and I mean, just so much in that story that, that also lays the foundation for your future and, and, yes. uh, sure. and seeing what's possible. Like you never know that we were speaking about in the beginning. It's a beautiful story. It probably meant so much to you at the time. Oh, you, you know, I was, funny enough, my dance career, wherever I was landing, I thought that this was the place I was supposed to be. I never thought it was going to change course at all. So when I got dancing to Harlem, I was so fascinated by all the dancers. They were so beautiful, so talented. I'd never seen, first of all, their level of ballet. And all these were Af uh, people of color, also, you know, and just, it was so uh, impressive to me. Um... But unfortunately, the last day of summer school, I got mugged. Oh! I was attacked, and my uh, I woke up in a hospital oh. with two friends of mine from the school, and I would just walk up. I just remember uh, Nicolette Marshall was in front of me. She was a dancer from the company, and she. I said, "Am I okay?" She's like, "Yes, you're in the hospital." She said, "You were knocked unconscious, um, but you're going to be fine. You're totally fine." She, she said, "The doctor will be in soon to see you." So she came in, the doctor. And she said, yes, you're totally fine. We want you to not fly for 24 hours to make sure you have no concussion, uh, 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 possible dangers or whatever, the, the flight that could cause more pressure in the brain. So um, I waited, I called my parents, let them know I was actually okay and they should not be worried, but of course they were worried. <laughs> and so me coming home uh, two days later, they were really terrified, but I got to the airport, uh, they were there to pick me up and I had actually grown a bit taller. So they were actually looking downwards to try to find me. When I showed up, they were like, where are you <laughs> <laughs> yes, because you are quite tall. How tall are you? I'm 6'3", 191. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you know what else I thought of briefly? I mean, I'm going to get into Ballet Frankfurt um, soon. Yes. Well, I'll wait. I'll wait. Okay. Like, okay, so your training then took you to yes. the National Ballet of Canada. And yes. And you met Bill Forsyth. Yes. So uh, Mr. Hewitt, my dance teacher, was... Um, had dance in Canada. He actually did the education there. He was very uh, fond and very good uh, good friends with um, the director, Betty Oliphant of the school. Um, and he had known her for years when his, his time there in Canada. And she was actually asked to, I think, teach for the company or be a ballet master for the company at the time, uh, but decided to go back to California for other reasons. Mm -hmm. um, so when I, came to the school and he was my teacher. He said, well, you of course gonna put you in the group with the other more advanced kids, but also you have to promise to come and take class with me on the weekends, which I also did. So um, that really helped form me in this short period of time to actually get myself uh, to some kind of level to actually become a dancer in the short period of time that I had. Um, but because of the mugging in New York at the Dancing of Harlem School, he suggested a year after that I go to audition for the National Ballet School of Canada because it was a safer city. Um, it was also a great school. And he said, you actually wouldn't have the problems that you had in New York. So that was our next plan. And that did work. I went to Vancouver to audition. I was uh, 
taken uh, for the summer course, me and another girl from, they were, it was quite amazing those, those uh, auditions because they would audition like hundreds of kids. And like in my group that I started with, there were only two of us selected. So I felt very honored to be part of that whole situation. Yeah. 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 And um, so my first years there, they were just, you know, study, study, study. And then the last year that I was there, Billy, uh, Billy came to do second detail. And I was at the time an apprentice in the company. And that was amazing. That was an amazing moment for me, I must say. So, so I have a question. Yeah, I would, if you don't mind, I'd like to go a little bit into this. So you were an apprentice with the company. Yeah. Were you in second detail? I mean, how, how did this come about? How did you meet him? I think okay. it might be a little similar to how I got affected <laughs> by him because of the San Francisco ballet, you know, I also, so I want to hear this. I'm just curious. So my story, we were doing a Nutcracker at the time and Nutcracker rehearsal, you have just all, everyone's in the studio, they're doing stuff. And of course, uh, Second Detail was already, was, had already been kind of set. Mm -hmm. I think he had maybe gone away to Frankfurt to come back to kind of uh, get it on the stage sometime after that, but like Jill and them, they already knew the choreography, Jill, Aaron, Watkins, Maurice Causey, they all were on board, you know? So one in rehearsal for Nutcracker, Jill is going over the choreography for Second Detail. I literally stopped in my track. I saw her doing these steps. It's the first, the first steps to the entrance where the girl's going to point, you know? And her, you know, Jill had that, that intricacy of those steps anyway in her body. And when she was doing this, I was like, what is that? What, I want to do that. <laughs> and they were like, oh, that's Billy's new band. And I was like, oh my God. I mean, it was just like watching a dream in front of you that I was like, if this could be some of my reality, I'd be so very happy. So lo and behold, Maurice had already had his contract for the, ba for, the uh, for Frankfurt Ballet. Um, I think Billy had already promised he and Jill contracts. And um, yeah, that was already kind of said before he went back to Frankfurt. So one night- and, and and Emily, um, not yet, not yet. And maybe she he had promised her into contract, but she didn't take it at that time. No. Okay. Okay. I don't think so. No, um, because the three of us came to Frankfurt. Uh, I came one. Uh, I came first, then Jill came a week after me, and Maurice came a week after her. Uh, we came to Frankfurt in June of two uh, 1991, I think it was. Yeah. So, um, because Maurice's uh, connection with Billy uh, and Maurice and I being friends as two Americans stuck in Toronto, you know. Uh, um, he one day calls me at four o'clock in the morning. Now I shared a phone. We were so student, uh, student life, you know. I shared a phone with uh, a few other students on another floor in the sort of dormitory uh, building. I get a knock on the door at four o'clock in the morning from Philip Lau, a dancer in the school at that time. And he was like, um, there's a Maurice is on the phone for you. And I was like, oh my God, I was like, something's definitely wrong because it's four o'clock in the morning. Why would Maurice be calling me at this time? Yeah. I go downstairs and I was like, uh, he's like, are you sitting down? And I was like, Maurice, are you okay? Have you been in an accident? What is wrong? He was like, sit down. He said, you have a contract with the Frankfurt Ballet. I was like, what? <laughs> he was like, yes, I was talking to Billy just now about my contract. Uh, and before I hung up, he said, uh, Maurice, Maurice, wait, wait, wait. And Maurice was like, what? He said, um, what about Damon? And he was like, what about him? He said, well, uh, he said, uh, what do you think about him? He said, he's very talented. He reminds me a lot of Stephen. Now, Stephen and Maurice had been friends in uh, SAB or American Ballet Theater School. That, that's where he oh, was. Oh, I didn't know that. So they knew each other and he referred, that, yeah, that I was kind of similar to Stephen somehow. Um, and um, uh, Billy said, well, tell him he has a contract with the French Ballet. I'm gonna take a chance on him. And that's how it happened. And I called him the day after. He actually was not available, reachable because there was a bomb threat in the, in the theater, supposedly. <laughs> and I got him the day after that. And he said, yes, I'm gonna take a chance on you. And I remember also mentioning to him about my hand. I said, Billy, what about my hand? Because they were uh, planning to make like prosthetic fingers for my hand. And he was oh, like, well, does it keep you? Say that again? I never knew that. No, nobody did. <laughs> I mean, I forgot about, when I left, uh, Canada, I completely forgot about the whole thing because he said, does it stop you from dancing? And I said, no, it doesn't. And um, he said, well, there's no problem. <laughs> so yeah, that was my story from Canada to Frankfurt. And um, I was just so grateful. I mean, when I got there, I was so happy. I mean, I 
there were a lot of people I didn't know, but there are a few like Nora Kimball I hadn't known because she had also uh, come to LA with American Ballet Theater. And I remember she was, I remember writing to my friends in New York about her from the school um, because she had come to do, um, yeah, she was, they were performing there and I uh, was supering for the company as well for La Baia Dare. And I came early to the studio and she was there warming up for a ballet from Clark Tippett. And she had this white unitard on, Nora Kimball, and a white unitard started warming up and those feet started speaking. And I was like, oh my God, who is this woman? <laughs> it was amazing, yeah. Wow, wow, wow. That's, that's, that's quite a story. Um, <laughs> and I mean, yeah, he, Billy was like that, right? He, he was. He, he uh, I love how he took risks. Yes. I love how he just said, let's try it. Yeah. He was always a why not person, right? Yes, really. Yeah, I know. Amazing. Um, well, I, amazing. So in your first years in Frankfurt, um, yeah. what, so like I always ask our Frankfurt Ballet piece, what were the roles that brought you to a new level of understanding? I mean, Garden 2 was created on you. I know yes. that. But yes. before that, or was that early on? Was that something that really brought you to a new level of understanding about yourself as a dancer and an artist? Well, I think, you know, when I first started the first year, I think also maybe like the first year and a half, I didn't do very much actually because the company, we were, I think about 42 dancers at the time. It was the most the company had ever been, I think. Um, and then it, this company starts to dwindle down slowly over the years to get into 30 somethings, you know, but it was like 40, 40 for a while, I think for the first two years I was there. So everyone had their spots, people were dancing, and they were doing their things. And I was the baby of the company at that time. Um, so I didn't do so much. The first actual dancing, like dancing role that I got to do, I think was second detail. I got to do uh, Tony's part. Okay. Um, and then that started to lead me to uh, some of Steven's roles doing like uh, Enemy and the Figure um, and then doing uh, eventually like Lost and those kind of ballets. But for, uh, and those also, of course, I mean, those really did start to form me because I started to take this responsibility and these amazing roles to do. And they really just like a fish in water, like you start to immediately adapt and learn through the process. So that really, um, were the kind of pivotal points when they started to change and develop in the company, yeah. And then Garden was such a special piece. It was yes. a quiet piece. And I always say about that ballet, I think it was a ballet that was a present to the dancers rather than a big audience. Oh, ah, that's true, that's Don't true. You that way? It yeah, yeah, like, yeah, absolutely. It felt like you were in a cocoon, this, the music and, how we related to each other and the environment yeah just david starting fishing yeah yeah and it was it was a very special very special um it really is i mean remember there were even had performances where like um i remember katie was on stage crying uh do you remember that performance she was like it was quite emotional sometimes because anything was possible i mean there's this kind of environment like the 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 way the 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 step the the those walking the the walking kind of freeze moments you know those simple the simplicity of it all but then yeah it kind of draws you into this environment that you're like wow you're really wrapped it's like being in a film like watch being in, in a cinema watching a film and you're just wrapped in it you cannot really escape it because you're in it um yeah it was a very beautiful experience as well yeah, yeah. Tony actually sent me recently the solo that Billy created for me. He was like, oh, sometimes he sends me little videos of me doing stuff, you know? And, I, you know, you forget what you used to look like, what you used to do, you know, physically. You And I was like, was that me? <laughs> it's just so funny sometimes to see yourself dancing when you were in your 20s and now being your, you know, 50. <laughs> yeah, but so. I have this weird thing, like, did I, would I do that? But it's so funny. Yeah. I like that. But at the same time, I still feel it. Yes, I still that's true. feel what that was like. That's true. You know? Actually, when he sent me the solo, I hadn't seen the, we, we did Garden for a, for that period. I think we, we didn't really uh, perform it too often after that. I mean, 
it stayed for a moment, but it didn't really stay in the later years. Mm -hmm. So when I saw it, I remembered the choreography while watching it, but had you asked me to do the choreography, I couldn't, like second detail, I can do like still in my sleep, like those, those steps still sit in my body and my mind. But that ballet, because it was such a short period of time that it lasted, um, it was like watching a memory of myself in a way. Like I was like, oh yes, I did. <laughs> I really did that. I, it's recorded, I was there, but yeah, it's very funny. Yeah. I have a similar thing with Garden too. Yes. You know, it was also made, I mean, those were tumultuous times when those pieces were made. They were. They a were. lot of, a lot of things stuff were happening within the company. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So in 1996, you yes. were offered a principal contract with Nacho Duato's Com Compañía Nacional de Danza. Yeah. And you took it. Um, yes. And you danced there from 1996 to 2001. Yeah. Uh, and a few other Frankfurt Ballet people were there with you. Yes. Yeah. Um, Bertha was there. Bertha and Jennifer, right? Jennifer had already come back to Frankfurt at that time. She was already back. Um, oh, so you were only there with Bertha for music? Yes. Okay. And Ramon had been there a year before me. I actually took his contract. That's right. And he actually called me and said, listen, I'm going to leave. Um, I know Irena loves you, Irena Milovan. Uh, rest in peace. We loved Irena so much. Um, he said, because she would always, always call me her black diamond. She was, I think sometimes Patrick would come to Frankfurt and she would say to, to him, say hello to my black diamond. <laughs> and That's the like, way she said it, it, my black diamond. Yes. <laughs> it was diamond. like diamond, like your name. Emerge, emerge. And um, yes, yeah, she, uh, Ramon was like, you know, she loves you. If you want to come here, now's the time. He said, I'm gonna leave. You're gonna have my contract, my apartment. Um, if she loves you, you're basically in. Um, and so that's how that um, beginning started. And actually Nacho came to see me perform in The Hague. We, we were performing in The Hague at the time. I did like Enemy, uh, Quintet, and uh, there was another ballet. I, maybe even second detail or something like that. There was on the mixed bill. Mm. I think I did that night, uh, Enemy and Quintet. And uh, he was like, yes, you know, I would like to have you in the company. And uh, yeah, it was actually, it was kind of like saying, well, if you come here, I can't really offer you these things. You're doing so, such beautiful work here in the company now. Why do you actually want to come to my company? And I said, well, I would like to take a chance and see, I find your work beautiful. And I would like to see, uh, yeah, experience what it's like to, to do your work. So. That's finally how things folded out to. And a beautiful know. city you got to live in. And a beautiful city. You know, I learned a new language, I had wonderful colleagues. Exactly. Um, yeah. Great it was, culture, just, yes. just more adventure. Yes. Yes. But you weren't finished with Frankfurt Ballet. I was not. <laughs> um, you rejoined in 2001 um, yes. and stayed through the company's last performances in Paris. Yes. And I came and hung out with uh, with you guys in LA, which were kind of the last performance yes. in Cali. And I remember you and me and Alan and Stevie went to Disneyland. Went to Disneyland. Yes. I just threw the t-shirt that I had away last you year. You are what you eat. You are what you eat. That was what your t-shirt said. <laughs> right? It's yeah. true. It's true. <laughs> we had so much fun. We were running oh around that God. park like, oh that my God. Was I, so... I have to find those pictures again. I have to say. <laughs> and it was my father. We actually, we had planned to go to Magic Mountain. Do you remember that? Wow. Oh. And my father said, well, look, <laughs> he was like, you know, if you try to go to Magic Mountain, he's like, you will never get there and back. He said, it's impossible. He said, you met, best bet is to go to Disneyland, you know, have a good time and you'll make it there and back with no problem. But they said Magic Mountain was just, he said Magic Mountain would, would just be too far. You would get stuck in traffic and you would never. That's true because we were in Orange County and mm -hmm. Disneyland exactly. was in Anaheim, which was really, exactly. really close. And yes. I think we took a taxi there and back. Can you imagine how much we paid? <laughs> we were stars at the time. <laughs> 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 so um so I must ask, so how was it to return to Ballet Frankfurt? What drew you back? Okay. Why did you return? So 
although my experience in Spain was a wonderful one, it did not come without its adversities. Um, and at one point I thought, well, you know, this is kind of working, but it's not really working the way I thought it might. Mm -hmm. And um, I kind of gave myself the last creation that was gonna be created. If I was going to be uh, in the creation, I said I would say, but if I was not gonna be in the creation, like uh, just a second cast or something, I thought, well, maybe it's time for me to make other plans. And the casting went up and I actually was not in the cast. I was second cast for a, a role. And I said, maybe this is a sign. So uh, I went to visit a friend of mine actually in Berlin. And I was like, oh, Germany. <laughs> Germany. <laughs> I do. I, I recall enjoying my time in Germany. And um, I was like, I think, Damon, you need to go on Monday morning and just make a new choice. So I went to uh, Nacho's office and we had a, a meeting and I said, well, I think it's time for me to go. I'm going to quit. And um, I hadn't talked to Billy or anybody yet, um, but I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to call Billy. I think that evening I called him. Uh, he was not reachable as, again. Um, but they left a message for him. I think he called me the day after that. And he said, oh, I hear you want to come back to the company. And I was like, yes, I really love to. And uh, he said, and you know, the, the thought sat in my mind because we'd actually performed in Frankfurt. Uh, I think it was two, uh, what year was that? Maybe like 98 or something like that. Uh, two years after I joined the company in Spain. And um, we were there, Billy was making a joke. There was a, a check on stage. I think Short had some kind of check from a performance of something like maybe like, it looks like a check like you would see like an Isabel's dance or something like that, like some big piece of cardboard. And um, he made some kind of joke like he would pay something to have me back in the company, like, a, you know. And um, and I stayed in my mind the whole time, you know. And he was just, again, so even when I saw him that, that time, that short time that I visited Frankfurt with the company, um, he was just, again, so sweet to me and so fatherly, that whole, you know, Billy effect that he always had. Um, so when I quit the company in Spain, I, uh, I called him and he was like, of course, I'd love to have you back. So he uh, found a contract from somewhere and I was there the next season. And the first day coming back to the studio, I almost cried because the environments were so different. Um, you know, in La Compagnie Nacional de Danza, it's quite a structured company and it has a certain uh, rigor to it. Um, and Miranda Milovan, she was like, you know, she was very strict about her class and stuff. And also the people in the company, they kind of really, it was like an army. They were beautiful. I mean, beautiful dancers they did there, you know, but this is a very different environment. When mm -hmm. I went to Frankfurt Ballet the first day back, there was laughter. There was that uh, studio upstairs with the light. Uh, I don't know. It was just such a different, and I almost, I thought, what was I doing for four years in, in this other environment that seemed so less of this like less laughter, less, you know, this creativity. And also when Billy was there, um, I think he started working in the rehearsal after that with like Peggy or somebody. And just seeing his enthusiasm, his whole like childlike excitement of when he would work with someone, it was so like, oh my God, I've been missed. You know, I was so, just so happy to have returned because it was really like, yeah, like coming home, like, a, yeah. He is, he's extraordinary. He, you know, and he still has that incredible, he will yes. never lose that enthusiasm for. He loves dance. He loves, he loves working with people. He, he loves, loves bringing things out of people. It really is, I mean, I think you mentioned something about like, how does this affect in my, uh, um, my life today? And the fact that his ability to, Create with people. He actually, I, he's like, I need to be able to kind of relate with you in some way to get some things out of you. He needs to like know something about you to be able to get something out of you, you know? And I, I find the same thing with my clients. Like I've got to find some kind of understanding of their background, of understanding of who they are as a person to be able to train them as well, because without it, you have no way to connect to the person as well. It's really, I'm sure you as yeah. with choreography, like uh, you probably must also have to find that way to work with dancers to have some kind of connection to them before you can actually create things on them. Otherwise there's no, it's like, yeah, no tactile feeling to create with. Well, you're right, Damon. And, you know, yeah, this is the 12th, you know, conversation of, you know, with Frankfurt Ballet peeps, but yes. we all say the same thing. And that was, boy, what an incredible education we got with Bill about, yes in so many ways, but in this yes. particular way, in yes. relating to people. Yes. Everybody from the time <laughs> when I was there, you know, you know, our family, our colleagues, yeah, yeah. 
that are still in the field and even not in the field, like yes. you are relating. Yes. We, this was his way and we learned this way and yes. was given so much through this way. Yes. It, 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 the seeds talk about again, seeds that were yes. have carried through. Yes. But I have something else to say. I think Billy also was attracted to the people. You know, people attract people who in their lives as well, right? Yes. And I think Bill could see. I really do. I think he could see and feel seeing this in people, not just ability, physical ability. I think you could see and feel things in people that he knew would come on a journey with him. Wow. I might be totally wrong about this. No, like, you're on look at yeah. our colleagues. Yeah, yeah. Look at I mean, everybody them. who's been and all of our colleagues, they've also they've all gone on to do great things. They've all taken some greatness with them that he gave us all. And like from like uh Eda Holmes to Kate Strong to I mean, those, all the ones, like all of you, like Jacopo, um, David, um, Crystal Pipe, uh, Tony, I mean, everybody's still working in the dance world. And I mean, the works, are, I mean, I don't follow dance too much nowadays. I mean, I do watch things once in a while, but I mean, the level of dance I see from my ex-colleagues is still such on a level that I think like, it's amazing what those, um, influence that he gave us and what he taught us, what it has uh, brought to fruition in the, in the dance world, basically, and also in the world of art overall. I mean, it's incredible. And it, and it's, it also, I think one of the big, huge um, keys to all of this, yes. if he gave us the vision to find greatness within ourselves. That's true. He taught true. us how to trust yeah and follow our own voices. Yes. He gave us that. He, so yeah. he invested and pulled a lot out, but he also let us know, he pulled out the stuff that was really there and waiting. Sure. You know, so just, you know, one of these incredible, like the, some of the other people in your life, when you think about how your life is shaped. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. how lucky we are as human beings. Sure. Definitely. And then we took the initiative. We decided, yes. well, you know. Yes. I think also in Billy's uh, um, credit, his ability to show, um, you know, many, I was speaking with Tony yesterday about this fact. You know, many choreographers will get stuck in a, well, not stuck, but they will form a style that they know is their own. I mean, whether it be, uh, Killian or whomever, um, and they will stay in their style. It's always a recognizable style. Like this is so and so stamp. This is what they do, you know. But Billy also being the person who not only when he would make a ballet, wasn't able to rework something, recreate it, uh, completely change it, break it down, do all these other things to it, um, and show us that kind. Of, that's kind. Of, that's quite a vulnerable thing for a person to show. Like who, have you ever seen a designer like make a dress and say, oh, I hate it. Like, um, let's take the sleeve off and let's, you know, uh, rip the skirt in half, whatever. People don't normally do that kind of stuff. Once the thing is created, it's on set, it's on stage. I mean, it's that set in stone is for life, you know? But he actually showed us his vulnerability by being able to, and his intelligence at the same time to show us, you can actually take this apart, redo it and represent and it's gonna be even better than it was before, you know? I mean, uh, it's such a amazing talent, the intellect, the um, vulnerability that he showed, yeah, is very impressive. Still and the day. possibility through the, the journey you just described, yeah. you know, we learned that there is infinite possibility. Yes, exactly. And exactly. that change is the only constant. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's exactly it. Right. That's exactly it. So, Damon, you are now this world-renowned leveled Pilates oh. <laughs> trainer. And do you feel like, <clears throat> I, I think I already know the answer, but I want to hear from you. And, and 
do you feel like how did your years as a dancer we might have really talked about it right just now but how did those years as a dancer um shape your next choices we really just we also really talked a lot about it but you yes. have to add well i think they also It must be the fact that um, through all those experiences of dancing in Frankfurt Ballet and getting to know yourself as a person, um, when I started this career, um, you bring, you know, unknowingly all the things with you and your baggage uh, and your, you know, let's say your your good baggage um, <laughs> to, to 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 draw from, you know, like. Um, there's so many things like, you know, uh, training, being a trainer is a very personable thing. So you've got to have a certain way about how you re relate to people, the chameleon like uh, change you have to make from client to client. You've got to always be flexible. You cannot be like one thing to all your clients. You've got to be able to relate to all those people as they are in their moment. You know, if they come in with some sort of pain, if they come in with a certain level or uh, of intelligence or a certain body awareness or whatever, or maybe a lack of. You've got to be able to reach them in a very quick time to get them to get the best out of them at that moment. Mm -hmm. And that's really, I think, what also helped me, helps me today as a Pilates trainer, because I learned those things while being around Billy, around uh, seeing how he related with us as dancers, um, to be able to relate also to my clients. And uh, yeah, it is funny how these things, it's, I mean, I don't think Billy was like trying to teach us these things to set us up for our careers, but the outcome of that is the fact that we did adapt these uh, tools from him. And I think they've helped all of us in our careers after Frankfurt Ballet. Yeah, absolutely. They were life lessons. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So Damon, we're at the point now where I'm going, I ask you three questions that I ask everybody. Okay. Um, the first of which in, so I'm gonna speak about dance community, but you can speak about the community you're in as well, since you okay. are, yeah, no, uh, like you said, kind of on the periphery of dance um, these days, but in supporting and building a more equitable community, Yes. What are some specific daily practices we can be active with? Well, I think first having open mind. I mean, that's one thing we've got to try to keep because this world, anyone's environment can start to kind of uh, form them of how they're supposed to be thinking. But it's important to always stay open and, and flexible and question sometimes what you actually how you see things, or what you think about certain things in certain ways. I mean, um, I was just having a conversation the other day about uh, in Holland, the Svarte Pete situation. Do you know about Svarte Pete? No. What's, oh, so yeah. no, at, tell me what's going in on. The, at Christmas time, there's a, a character Svarte Pete that was been, it's like a child, uh, childhood favorite of all the children. Like he's like the kind of naughty, um, helper of Santa, of Santa Claus, um, and children love him. But because of this sort of uh, depiction of kind of like what we would call in America kind of black face, it was like he was painted uh, brown or uh, sometimes black because it's supposed to be the soot from the chimney that had yeah. gone on his skin. And I think he also had kind of like red lips and like kind of a like a gypsy earring and like a, a hat and like a kind of curly wig. Yeah. Um, and she was saying, you know, for me at the time, I never thought anything negative about Sparta Pete. I never thought it could even affect anyone negatively. Yeah. But when I when this theme came up a few years ago, actually in the Netherlands, they were trying to actually completely cancel Sparta Pete. Um, they people adults started to think like, oh, maybe this could actually be for some person of color a traumatizing thing because I'm sure children uh, have no uh, filter. You know, children when you're at school, a child will, of course relate a person of color to uh, a far to Pete, like uh, make a joke of them, make them maybe feel bad about their skin color. Mm -hmm. um, and she said, it was only until they actually began to bring this thing up that I started to kind of open my mind to think like, oh, maybe we should reconsider how we actually see this whole situation. Um, so in the dance world, in the 
uh, it's important, I think, why couldn't we see like a black swan on Sage or why couldn't we see, uh, I don't know, all these like typical things that exist. You know, the, the stage is a very magical space. I remember actually doing, uh, if I think about my career, like dancing um, uh, Lost in a Small Detail uh, as a ballad I danced. It was a ballad that like, when, you, when you're in that stage in that environment with those walls there, you know, you were free when your improviser came up to do whatever came to your spirit at that moment. It was nothing, there was nothing to hold you back. You were on a stage, you were in a, a magical space and you could do whatever your creativity allowed you to, to bring to the stage. Um, and for that point, I see no reason why these classical roles or these classical things that have been set in stone like Giselle or, or Swan Lakes or whatever, you can do anything you want with them. You can make the people, yeah, I don't see why that has to be kind of a limited space. It is not limited, it is magical. It's actually all things are possible on the stage. Let people be creative on the stage. Don't put them in boxes and say, you must be, the, and this must be this way, and that must be that way. Because a storybook says, you know, storybook is a book. It's like something that's written, but a, a stage, a performance is not written. It's actually living. So always be open to let things be what they could possibly be. That's my point. <laughs> Beautiful, that's right. Yeah, it's a limitless space. Yes. So let's give everybody the chance to be limitless. Exactly. Yeah, beautiful, thank you. Um, so you've shared many, but this is like the spontaneous section, the okay. next two questions. Um, do you have a spontaneous favorite or impactful memory um, that comes up from your creative life, from your career? Desperate? A spontaneous moment. Um, Something that comes to you now, like as being like, oh, that was really fun or really inspiring or. Okay. I mean, I can't think of one right, right now, but just the environment that we had in Frankfurt Ballet, which was so always unpredictable. You never knew what was gonna happen the day you walk in the studio. I mean, anything that happened, it was always a very bubbly environment. Like once a day started um, and knowing the rehearsals that were gonna take place, anything had happened, especially like, like we were in a creative time, like maybe when we were creating like alien action or something like that, like all those things that, that, that took place people, because we were also asked to create so much, you know, so people were creating, things were being uh, developed on a daily basis. Um, and just to be in the environment, to watch what, how things were being uh, put together to go onto the stage was always like uh, living in this moment because, uh, you know, Billy would like, um, hey, so, uh, you know, Helen and, and Frank, get up, and show me your duet or, or, you know, so-and-so, show me your solo, show me your, it was this whole, and anything was possible. I mean, it was such a bubbly, lively environment to be in it was it was amazing it was amazing i mean i'm not sure that was the only kind of creation that i lived in but i'm maybe you as correct for now also still experience that kind of stuff but i don't know if it compares to what we had in frankfurt for you as well but i mean those times for me were quite amazing i mean the electricity of the whole thing in the air that was just yeah incredible it yeah. was incredible totally agree <laughs> yeah and do you have an insight in something you can share about living a continually creative life? Because you're creative in this life that you lead right now as well. Do you have an insight that you could share with us about, you know, living in this creative space? Um, I would just just to be to give gratitude because it's something that I think. Uh, People ask me, do I still, do I miss being a dancer? And I, I say, no, I don't. I luckily was very pleased with my dancing career as a whole. I got to do so many things, even, you know, switching from uh, Frankfurt Valley to going to, to Spain and coming back, that whole fullness of those, those experiences together. Um, I didn't go to like a day job after that was over. So being com coming into Pilates with a very physical job, uh, simulating my mind as well and uh, learning about a new uh, method. Um, but yeah, 
just the gratitude of the fact that we are so fortunate to be able to work with our bodies, to help people with their bodies and their goals they may want to achieve, whether it be in dance or with a lot of by me or whatever. Um, and yeah, to make a difference in people's lives. I mean, uh, I was telling Tony the other just yesterday as well that um, you know, when we're dancing, we uh, perform for people, and so you don't always know everyone's um, uh, experience they will take with them when they leave the theater. You know, they don't all come back to say thank yous or whatever, or, or congratulations, or, or share their um, experience they had watch the performance. But when I teach Pilates, like my clients, I have had clients sometimes who will just like write me a message after a lesson and say, you have no idea I've been going to a therapist or to a, a acupuncturist for years trying to find a way to get the liquid out of my ankles. And after today's lesson, I can see my ankles when I get home. I'm like, I mean, these little things that make a, a difference in people's lives is just really, you think, I mean, I'm not God, I'm not a doctor or anything, I'm just a Pilates trainer, but it is such a gift to be able to help someone in their life and their own bodies to feel better in their bodies. There's nothing worse than being like a, a prisoner in your body, feeling pain and feeling discomfort. But if you can alleviate someone's pains and someone's discomfort, discomforts by the work that you do, it is priceless. It really is a priceless thing to do. Yeah. Oh, Damon, every time I have these conversations with, um, you know, especially my Frankfurt Ballet family, yes. it reminds me of how much I, uh, you know, the miles between and how how far away we live from each other, but at the same, by the same token, how, how easy it is and how much the bond that we share during yes. this time, it's amazing that it's like time hasn't passed and we yeah. haven't had all this space between us. Yeah. And yeah, it so was, I mean, what a joy to sit with you today. Aww. and hear about likewise. your journey. Likewise. And, I uh, mean, I'm so proud of you. I mean, all things you've been doing. I still hope to make it somewhere in Europe or uh, to go to America to see some your ballets, of course. I have a secret to tell you after we're done with this. Uh, <laughs> we will see each other soon. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, Damon, um, Thank you. Uh, you are a joyfully beautiful human being with uh, so giving. Um, I'm sure you give light. I know you give light to so many people. Um, so, uh, so much respect and love. Um, Same here. Do you have an Instagram handle or even the website of where you teach where people could actually find out a way to work with you in Amsterdam or find out more about you. Yes. I do have an Instagram, uh, Damon Hart. Um, and uh, I don't have a website, unfortunately. Um, uh, yes. They're just going to have to keep up with you on Instagram then. And Facebook as well. There you go. Yes. So yes. you will have, um, everybody watching, there is going to be a short bio of Damon's uh, with this video when it goes up uh, later. Okay. Today. And we have guests every week. Our next guest will actually be a lighting designer, um, wow. designer for Boston Ballet, Brandon Sterling Baker will be our next guest. Now it's time for thanks, Damon. Okay. Thank you Hello. so much. Thank, thank you to our dance community and the community oh. that holds us up. Uh, thank you, Gracie Fina. Thank you, Gracie. You are the extraordinary <laughs> superhero of Creative Vitality Jam Sessions. <laughs> and I love you, Damon. Love you too, Helen. Mm. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>